Hello, this is Dr. John Cavanaugh. Welcome back. AJS 101, Introduction to Criminal Justice, Lesson 8, Part 3, <laughs> the final part of Lesson 8. So let's, let's begin. We're going to talk about the criminal trial, how it's conducted. Now, the criminal trial is a highly choreographed proceeding with many rules, like the rules of evidence and the rules of criminal procedure, and many traditions. Uh, you know, all rise when the judge comes in, uh, things like that. Now, the American court system involves an adversarial system where the defense attorney and the prosecutor battle each other with facts and cross-examination under the watchful eye of a neutral referee. And who might that be? The judge. In order to convince an unbiased panel that their side is correct, and that panel, of course, is the jury. Now, in an adversarial system, the defense and prosecution assume an advocacy model role where they argue their sides zealously, but within the confines of the law and legal ethics. So they have to follow the laws of criminal procedure, and lawyers also have ethics, you know, about not allowing false evidence to be admitted and giving the proper uh, evidence to the other side. So they have to stay within those boundaries. Now, Let's talk about steps in the trial process. Trial initiation. The Sixth Amendment guarantees defendants the right to a speedy trial. Uh, too many cases and inefficiency will slow down that process. Now, the Speedy Trial Act requires federal courts to hold trials within 70 working days of an indictment. Many states have also set time limits, usually 90 to 120 days. However, delays caused by the defendant or those out of the control of the state or federal authorities often do not count against this time limit. So one of the first things that happens, of course, is jury selection. Potential jurors form a jury pool and prosecution and defense lawyers question potential jurors during voir dire. That's French, V-O-I-R-D-I-R-E. And voir dire is the questioning of the jurors to see if they're uh, uh, qualified to be jurors, they're not biased, etc. <clears throat> and the prosecutors and defense attorneys can accept them or ask that they be removed for cause. Uh, what might causes be? Well, bias might be a cause, racial bias. Uh, it could be uh, conflict of interest. Maybe uh, the juror is a relative of the person on trial. Uh, or in capital cases, cases where there can be a death penalty, objection to the death penalty, sometimes. Uh, now, if a judge will not remove a juror for cause, lawyers on either side can use a set number of challenges that do not have to be explained. And these are called preemptory, P-R-E-E-M-P-T-O-R-Y challenges. However, <laughs> Preemptory challenges cannot be based upon juror race or juror gender, because that would be discriminatory. But if a lawyer just thinks that eh, this juror doesn't look right, he's probably, you know, doesn't like my client for whatever reason, and you can't get excused for cause, you can't convince the judge that there's a bias, then if it's really something that the, the lawyer is concerned about, the lawyer could use one of a few preemptory challenges to reject that potential juror. Juries kept isolated to prevent exposure to news of the trial are called sequestered juries. And again, at the end of the day, they get into a bus, they're transported to a hotel, newspapers have articles about the trial clipped out of it, they can't watch TV news where, where they might be exposed to the trial. And they're, they're told to be careful in their conversations on the phone with family members or others not to discuss the case. All right. The first actual courtroom drama after the jury selection are the opening statements. Now the trial begins with opening statements from the prosecution and defense in which each side describes the facts they will offer to prove their case and how they will prove it. Uh, opening statements are a roadmap to the jury. Uh, no evidence is offered during opening statements. It's simply explaining uh, what the tactic will be of, of each side. Uh, Ethically, lawyers can only allude to evidence during opening statements that they have and can prove. Uh, you couldn't say in opening statements that I am going to introduce an eyewitness 
who saw the, my defendant, the accused, on the other side of town at the time of the murder, unless he, in fact, had such a witness, and that's what they were going to say. When the defense has little evidence to present, they will explain how bad the state's case is and how they will attack it. Because again, you can't offer evidence that's false. Prosec uh, let's talk about the actual presentation of the evidence. Now, evidence is anything useful to the judge or jury, depending on who's going to decide the case, in deciding the facts of a case. It can be direct evidence or it can be circumstantial. So direct evidence is evidence that, if believed, directly proves a fact without the need to draw inferences. And when we talk about inferences, uh, we're talking about uh, having to draw conclusions. Uh, if it were an inference, you would have to be drawing deductions or conclusions from the evidence. Uh, so let's give an example of, of, uh, of that. Um, one example might be uh, eyewitness testimony or videotape of an incident. Uh, a videotape, uh, say in a convenience store of a robbery taking place, that's direct evidence. You see the person doing the robbery. You don't have to draw any conclusions. You don't have to infer anything from it. So that would be true direct evidence if you believe it. Same with the testimony of an eyewitness. Now, circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence that requires interpretation or a person to draw a conclusion from it. Example, gunpowder residue on a suspected shooter's hand or finding a murder weapon in a suspect's home. Uh, now, a person, by the way, can be convicted solely on circumstantial evidence, but you must draw an inference. So if somebody shot somebody to death and the defendant was found several blocks from the scene, uh, five minutes after the police were called, and they arrested him and they, they took samples from his hand and discovered gunpowder residence, or residue, that is not direct evidence. It does not prove that this person shot the gun that killed the defendant. Uh, because theoretically, he might have fired a gun two hours earlier and the residue is still on his hand from that incident. So that kind of evidence is indirect. You have to draw a conclusion from it. But hey, enough circumstantial evidence can easily bring somebody uh, to draw a conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt that somebody did something. I mean, let's say that uh, witnesses saw two men arguing, violently arguing, and they both went into a home. And the witnesses said that two minutes later they heard a gunshot and they saw one of the men run out of the uh, building holding a gun. And that individual was, into, uh, was caught by the police two blocks later with the gun in his possession. They did a test on the gun and the bullet that was found in the dead person was fired from that gun. Now, every bit of that evidence is circumstantial. It doesn't directly prove that the person uh, killed the person, or fired the gun and killed the person. However, it is powerful circumstantial evidence that would lead almost everybody to believe that this person, in fact, was guilty. So you can be convicted on circumstantial evidence. All right, let's talk about other classifications of evidence. Real evidence uh, is anything physical like a gun, fingerprint, document. Documentary evidence is real evidence in written form. Uh, testimonial evidence is the oral uh, statements or testimony of people. Now, to be admissible, evidence must be relevant. It must relate to the case. The fact that a person accused of being a sniper is an expert sharpshooter is relevant. A rape victim's prior sexual history is not relevant. So it has to relate to the case at hand. To be admissible, evidence must also be material. Uh, and by material, we mean it, it must be powerful and capable of, in, uh, of influencing the outcome. The fact that a rape suspect is male is relevant to the case, but immaterial. It's not powerful in proving guilt or innocence just because you're a male. Now, even evidence that is relevant and material may be inadmissible if it is inflammatory. Inflammatory evidence is overly emotional evidence that is apt to bias a jury. Examples might include um, uh, pictures of a crime scene where the person was brutally uh, murdered or injured. 
Now, evidence erroneously allowed into the proceeding will form the basis of an appeal of a conviction if it had substantial and injurious effect or influenced the jury's verdict. If it didn't do this, even if it was inadmissible, it's called harmless error. But something which really prejudices the jury could uh, cause uh, a new trial. Let's say it's a person who's uh, being tried for rape and uh, the person had a prior conviction for sexual abuse or something like that. Uh, that could be considered inadmissible. Uh, uh, by, not a conviction, but a prior arrest for rape where there was no conviction. That would be inadmissible and would prejudice the jury if they heard it and probably result in a mistrial. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about the testimony of witnesses. Now, testimony is oral evidence given by a sworn witness during a trial. And only competent witnesses may testify. And competent witnesses are those that have personal knowledge of the information and know that they must tell the truth. Um, in, uh, uh, mentally incompetent people, uh, insane people, uh, and small children may be ruled incompetent to testify, either because of their mental disability or, or the lack of age and reason. And we're usually referring to children like under the age of seven. Now, a defendant may refuse to testify based upon the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And the prosecutor may not infer to the jury that this exercise of a constitutional right suggests guilt. The prosecutor cannot comment on the defendant's refusing to testify. Now, the person who calls a witness questions the witness first, and this is called direct examination. When completed, the other attorney can question the witness, and this is called cross-examination. Uh, and cross-examination tests the credibility and the memory of the witness. It's the other side trying to challenge that witness. Now, questions cannot be leading during direct examination, but they are allowed to be leading during cross-examination. And a leading question is a question that suggests the answer. So if I'm the defense attorney and I am cross-examining the prosecution's witness who has said bad things about my defendant, I might say, isn't it true that you hate my defendant? Isn't it true that my defendant beat you out of a job several years ago? That's suggesting the answer. But it's okay to do that because this is cross-examination and you couldn't expect the person being uh, examined to voluntarily uh, offer that information. You know, if, if all the other lawyer could say during cross was, is there any reason why you might not like my client? They might say nothing. So you can lead them during cross. Offering false testimony under oath is the serious crime of perjury. Now, redirect examination and recross examination may follow until no longer needed to clear up facts. So if one side does direct examination, the other side does cross examination and reveals some problems, well then the other lawyer who called the witness can do a redirect to try to clear up those problems. And the cross examining lawyer can then do a recross to to question the redirect of the other lawyer. It can get complicated. Uh, defendants under the Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment are allowed to confront witnesses against them. However, children have been allowed to testify out of court over a TV camera to avoid being re-traumatized by seeing the defendant again or having to testify publicly. Now, hearsay evidence is evidence not based upon the personal knowledge of a witness, which makes it second hand. For example, somebody uh, saying somebody else heard that the defendant said something is not admissible because it is unreliable and not subject to cross-examination. The person who supposedly heard the defendant say something is not there. You can't question their impartiality. You can't question their physical ability to have seen or heard what they uh, are now testifying to. Uh, because, well, to what they're, someone who heard them say are testifying to. Now, exceptions include dying declarations by people who in fact die, spontaneous utterances said while the defendant was emotionally uh, uh, upset, or prior out-of-court statements by witnesses. These are exceptions, and you can admit them during hearsay, especially dying declarations, because the person who said them can't be found and brought into court. So if you didn't allow hearsay, 
then that information may never uh, be brought to the jury's attention. And it is thought that as long as the jury knows that it's hearsay and not subject to cross-examination, it's better to allow it in than exclude it completely. All right, closing arguments. After all of the witnesses from both sides are, uh, are uh, heard and cross-examined, then closing arguments are done. Closing arguments are oral summations of the case presented at the end of the trial by both sides. So the prosecution gets to do a closing argument and the defense gets to do a closing argument where they pretty much restate their case or they state why the other, and state why the other side's case is, is flawed. After that, the judge will charge the jury. And the judge's charge is the judge's final instructions to the jury on the law, which they have to apply in terms of what are the elements of this crime, and also on, uh, on jury procedures. The, the judge will explain that they, they get into the jury room, they vote for a foreman, the foreman leads discussion, you know, everybody gets to ask questions. If they want to hear testimony repeated, they can get, call the judge and get a transcript. Uh, of that part of the testimony. If they want to see evidence that was presented, the evidence can be brought to them. Those are the instructions. And of course, that they all have to unanimously agree on a verdict. Uh, and that the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is less than a certainty, but more than a hunch. Some judges restate the facts, and in some states, judges can comment on the credibility of witnesses during a judge's charge to the jury. Uh, let's talk about the jury system as we close this lesson. Some people criticize the jury system because some jurors are incapable of reasoning rationally. They're not too bright. Uh, or they're biased, uh, especially racially biased. Uh, alternatives to the jury system cons uh, considered include replacing juries with panels of judges. Uh, instead of having jury trials, have uh, three judge panels listen to the evidence. Or perhaps uh, having professional qualified jurors, ha have people apply for the job, prove that they're reasonable, unbiased, and they're rational, and then make them paid jurors. Uh, however, the Constitution of the U.S. would have to be amended to allow this because the U.S. Constitution guarantees all of us a trial uh, by our peers, and these people would not be our peers. Okay, that concludes Lesson 8. So study all your notes and uh, take the Lesson 8 test and do well, and then move on to...